All right, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Here we go. This is a um, uh, sampling, and I've been talking about for almost a year that we're going to start taking the online stuff a bit more seriously. We did a couple classes that went over pretty well, um, and we're here now uh, doing a second one here. Uh, what you're witnessing now is. Uh, Video number four, part four on Imam al Ghazali's right, etiquettes of marriage. So what we have already did is philosophy, forced celibacy, uh, and the superiority of, of, of marriage over being single. Uh, firstly, can we do a sound check, you guys on um, Facebook, if you can hear properly? <clears throat> All right. Can someone tell me if they can hear properly? All right. All right. Good. So, uh, Safina online, we're starting to to do these things, and we record a lot of stuff. But we figured to give you a little bit of a a sampling of stuff while we're in the process of recording. So today's session is on. Uh, is the fourth lecture in this Ghazali's Etiquettes of Marriage, and it's on the disadvantages of marriage. So before you get so excited, oh, this is going to show us how to get married, no, uh, and get excited about marriage and all this, well, you got to know in advance the hardships, all right, of getting married, that the idea of getting married brings with it uh, three main hardships, all right, three main hardships, okay? Okay. And the first hardship is the difficulty of obtaining a lawful income. That it is not easy at all to uh, obtain a lawful income. The most serious drawback, Imam Ghazali says, is that it's nearly impossible to make a fully 100% legitimate livelihood. Okay? Uh, very few can do this. Now, Imam Ghazali is writing how long ago? Uh, he died 11-11, right? So he's, he's talking about a century ago, or uh, sorry, a millennium ago. Today applies to us is the hadith of the Prophet wasallam that there's going to come a time when the dust of riba is on everything, all right? So imagine. Now, marriage may cause one to make moral compromises in the quest of income. So in the previous video, we talked about how one of the reasons behind marriage is that it actually completes a person's uh, character in that you come to know Allah Azza wa Jal in ways that you would not have outside of marriage. So when you have dependence and you have people dependent upon you, you start to have reliance upon Allah for the rizq. You need the rizq, right? So you start relying upon Allah for that and you learn to rely upon Him. But there's a drawback. That what happens when your iman decreases, you start to make moral compromises in the quest for income. So how many people out there are actually could be even criminals or could be doing some seriously unethical things, okay? Uh, the main motive behind it is their fear for their children's uh, livelihood, okay? Fear for their children's livelihood and fear for their, or competition, that their wife is seeing other guys, right, doing a lot better than they are. So they need to, you know, eliminate that type of, uh, uh, that negativity, okay? In contrast, the bachelor is safe from this. He's safe and he has a peace of mind, all right, of not having the dependency, all right, of children or the dependence of children and spouse relying upon him. All right, so the first thing here is that a man will make moral compromises in order to fulfill the expenses. And these days, I mean, we know we just saw the Republican tax cut for the rich, and it's going to kill the middle class. And again, systematically, there's like a war waged on the middle class. If you want to know what's a good country to live in, you look at three qualities. You could study. All right, the three qualities are, number one, cleanliness of the streets. If the streets are clean... 
it tells you a lot. Just drive around the country, okay? If the streets are clean, it tells you a lot. Number two, justice in the courts, all right? So you need to ask around and see if people go to court in this country, are the courts fair? All right, that's number two. Number three is a nice, thick middle class. And in this country, they're waging war on the middle class. And it's uh, going to be harder and harder just to scrap a basic livelihood. Tuition is through the roof. College tuitions. This is the latest bubble that I feel bad for a lot of youth that they have to cover, let alone dowry and now all the expenses of marriage. According to a prophetic tradition, a man with a mountain of good deeds will be made to stand by the balance. He will then be questioned about his wealth, how he came by it and how he spent it. In settling these demands, he will use up all of his accumulated good deeds until the very last one. The angels will say, this is one whose good deeds were all consumed by his family on earth. And today, he is in need for his deeds, okay? So his family called on to him, all right, and blamed him for feeding them by unlawful wealth. And in order to settle the recompense there, he had to give them from his own good deeds. So when you were giving your children something, okay, uh, and your family wealth, and thinking you're doing them a favor, what you're going to realize, they're going to come to you on Yom Qiyamah, blame you for it, all right, and you're going to have to give you them from your good deeds. It is said that the first to fasten onto a man at the resurrection, they're going to latch onto him, all right, and they will stand before Allah Azza wa Jal and said, Oh, our Lord, give us our due from this man, the head of the household, okay? He left us in ignorance, so he didn't teach them, all right? So t teaching and educating one's family. This is one of the most important things in the deen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأْمُرْ أَهْلَكَ بِالصَّلَاةِ وَاسْطَبْرْ عَلَيْهَا Alright, teach your people the deen. Alright, teach your, your household the deen. Okay, and Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, when he finished completing the musnad, he gathered his entire family for, and for a series of days read to them the musnad. And the musnad contains over 40,000 hadiths. Right, his top student was his son Abdullah. Right, uh, Ibn Mas'ud would never do a khatim of Quran except that, or it was Anas bin Malik. He would first he would reach to the last few surahs, then he would gather his entire family and read to them. Okay, uh, and they would make the du'a together. So involving one's family in the deen and educating a person's uh, dependence on the deen. This is number one. Number two, he fed us unlawfully without our knowledge. He went, obtained unlawful wealth, and came back and put that on the table, okay? And that's what they ate from. So they're going to say, listen, we sinned because of him. He's the reason we sinned. So they're going to call for the recompense, and they're going to take from his good deeds. Because on that Yom Al-Qiyamah, no one, you know, Yom uh, Alayim Fa'umalun Wala Banun, right? Nobody cares about them, the, the, anyone but themselves. The only one who cares about others on that day is Sayyid al Sayyid Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And thereafter, when people are given permission to do intercession, then they do their intercession. But up to that point, nobody cares. Another hadith. Nobody meets Allah with a sin greater than that of having left his family in ignorance of the deen. Okay? So think about that. You want to get married and you're excited? Are you yourselves knowledgeable enough that you can now teach someone else? When you have a little 10-year-old, what are you going to do? Right? So you yourself have to learn. And I'm telling you, the opportunities to learn are so immense, it's unbelievable. What are you going to learn? Let's say you're someone say, okay, well, tell me, what do I need to do? The first thing you need to do is study Aqidah. You can spend a good year reading going to classes, bouncing around the internet for, from teachers who are reliable and you know a reliable teacher, how? By his peers or her peers. You know, do you see them interacting with other imams? That's the sign that someone has some peer review. Okay, uh, And then you study your aqidah. The next is tahara and salah. You're going to study tahara and salah. 
and then you're going to study at that point uh, the uh, um, uh, so, uh, so, Psalm, fasting, and zakah because you're going to be a, a working person and pay your zakah. And then thereafter, now that you have your fardain down, your basics that you know, at this point after that, you spend time on the shama'il of the Prophet wasallam, the descriptions of Sayyid al-Kawnayn wasallam, keeping in mind morals, manners, and spiritual uh, uh, rectification through shama'il of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And you could spend a long time on that. And once we get our theory right, we get our theory right, it could take time to, 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 to act upon it, right? To actually act upon it. But we need to get the theory right first, right? So we got to get these, the theory right first, and then we can, we can scrap. And this is what suluk is. It's a hard struggle to actually act upon this knowledge, and it takes years. One man said, I studied all the deen in five years, and then I studied ikhlas for 30 years. Right? In other words, trying to practice it with ikhlas for 30 years. Imam al-Ghazali says, This drawback is widespread. Few can escape it without having inherited or legitimately acquired wealth sufficient to support a man and his family. Another question that comes up often. A person inherits wealth that either is unlawful or mixed, lawful and unlawful, or they inherit it unlawfully. In other words, their parent didn't observe uh, the sharia in terms of the inheritance. So he distributed it or she distributed it how she wishes. Or that they shouldn't have distributed or been an inheritor at all. In other words, we know a Muslim does not inherit from a kafir, for example. So, But your, the parent could list a child. Who, who's not a Muslim could list a child who's a Muslim. What does he do with that wealth? All right, so that you give it out. What if, what if uh, you were a Muslim parent, distributed the, the inheritance unlawfully? It becomes your duty to portion out what you deserve, what the Sharia gives you, allots for you, all right? And whatever is remaining that's extra, that you have to give it to the one who, was, who didn't receive their share or divide it amongst the people who didn't receive their share, okay? Or, what you have to do is, uh, if the opposite, if you were uh, deprived of your share, right, inheritance should be given to you, and it's debated upon whether or not you should fight for your inheritance. One of the opinions is that you do not fight for the inheritance that you were owed, and the other opinion says, yes, you do. You can go and take your family members to court if you were robbed or, 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 or your inheritance was taken. But if they legally did it here in America and allocated the inheritance in a way that's unlawful, then there's no fight, right? You can tell them, listen, call your brother, listen, we didn't get the shares properly and you should fear Allah and, and, and distribute it properly. And it's up to him whether or not he does that. The third possibility is that you inherited mixed money. Mixed money. And mixed money is acceptable to take in Sharia. Mixed money is mal mukhtalat, meaning wealth that was partially gained lawfully and partially gained unlawfully. Okay? That you can take. So for example, I know a guy, you could say hypothetically, comes into my store, and I know this guy uh, has a gas station. And in this gas station, he sells lottery tickets and he sells gas. So his money is mixed, but he's now coming to me to buy a product from me. I don't have to, uh, you know, parcel out the percentage of money that's halal and that's haram. I can accept it. And you assume that it's from the halal. And this is from the mercies of the sharia. All right. So people inherit unlawfully or inherit unlawful wealth and then they feed their family with that. You, you know, you have to know that uh, on, like Surah Abbas says, I don't care about fathers, sons, daughters, or husbands, or friends, right? On Yom Al-Qiyamah, everyone seeks is for their nafs, okay? Is for themselves, and they're going to take that man account for feeding them unlawfully, okay? So, he says, one so situated can indeed escape this predicament, as can a man whose skill enables him to earn a livelihood by legitimate means, okay? And of course, he's listing what was a legitimate mean in his end, wood cutting, hunting, or any craft. Of course, that's independent of the authorities. Of course, that's in his day and age. For us, we have a lot of legitimate mean, uh, jobs. But even the legitimate skills can be used 
in corporations that are overall in an illegitimate business, okay? Illegitimate business. So just because you're an IT guy, well, you have to ask, what is the corporation or company that's employing you? And is that lawful? Yes or no? Like, is their entire business lawful? So yeah, I'm just doing the IT for these guys. Okay, well, what are they doing? All right, so that's another thing. Now, Ibn Salim, all right, Ibn Salim al-Basri is a disciple of Sahl al-Tustari. Radiallahu anhum, anhuma, and he he was asked about marriage, and he said it is the best course these days for a man assailed by overwhelming lust. All right, but however, if someone possesses self-control, it is better to abstain from marriage. Now, Imam Al Ghazali later in the chapter, he's going to negate this, and he's going to qualify it that if anyone believes that celibacy, and we talked about this in the previous videos that were not live streamed. If anyone believes that celibacy is superior to marriage, then we know that this is a bid'ah. And the Prophet ﷺ called a companion, uh, spoke about a companion uh, in order to send him a message. And he said, what an excellent man, if he only fulfilled all of my sunnah. Okay? So the word went to the man, and he came back, and he said, Oh, Masjid Allah, what is it from your sunnah that I don't do? And he said, you don't marry. And, the pro and then the man said, no, it is not out of... Uh, disbelief in marriage, it's inability to marry. So the Prophet helped him get married. Okay, So in this case, what Imam al-Ghazali is going to say is that marriage in itself, you must believe it's superior. However, there can be a circumstance in which to not marry is superior. In other words, if all the people available for marriage would corrupt your deen as opposed to benefit your deen, then at that point, it's better to, uh, to not, it's per permissible to not marry. Okay, or if uh, obtaining wealth for them would be impossible. Let's say hypothetically you're full of debt and you have no skills and you can't obtain the necessary wealth. So for a specific reason, it is permissible for someone to avoid marriage, and many ulama did that in the past. All right, that's uh, Imam al Nawi, for example, never married. Imam al Bukhari, there's no record that he married. Okay, uh, number of people didn't marry. Now number two. So the first uh, disadvantage has to do with wealth. Number two, difficulty of treating a wife properly. All right. The second drawback lies in the difficulty of giving wives their due. Okay. Having patience, and really, this should go both ways. All right. Uh, it usually, when you see Imam Al-Ghazali's writing, and many people actually, uh, they talk about this, and they sort of complain, etc. Okay. Uh, uh, etc. That Imam Ghazali always writes in his treatises of marriage to men, right? Okay, fine, that's him. So now that you're an adult, you can say, okay, him or her, right? Uh, yes, it applies to the husband or the wife. That was in that time he's writing for other men. And that's why he's always talking about the difficulty of giving wives their due. Well, I mean, a woman could say the difficulty of giving her husband their due. All right, that was in his time he's writing to men. So, you know, we can be mature and say, all right, that was, that was how he wrote. Uh, it doesn't mean that there's no credence to the opposite. All right, so uh, likewise in his chapters on paradise, he always talks about the paradise of men, right? Uh, what men receive in paradise, and then so many women get upset. Uh, all right, why not uh, the women? Okay, so he didn't write that. That doesn't discount that there is a lot for women in paradise, all right? So in any event, let's get back to the subject here. Uh, having sabr with the character of your spouse because everyone who is about to get married puts on their best you know puts their best foot forward no one comes in engagement and is cranky no one comes in a bad mood everyone comes in a good mood right well when you actually get married it's non-existent this idea that you can always be in a good mood you're not going to always be in a good mood right so you're going to have bad moods so to learn to have sabr, and as you're going to have bad moods, so the person that you married is also a human being that's going to have bad moods. You have to have sabr, all right? With, uh, and that's, this is what he's talking about, the difficulty of this sabr, all right? Bearing the trouble that they cause, right? And spouses could cause you trouble. They could waste your money. They could embarrass you in public. There's a lot of ways in which, all right, uh, in which, uh, you know, spouses can cause trouble. All right, so you have to have sabr with that. All right, the task of 
treating women properly, and here is some, a point that he's making, is greater than the task of a woman treating her husband properly. Because a husband can ruin a woman's day a lot more than, or a woman's life even, more so than a woman can ru uh, ruin a man's life. And I'm sure that some men will disagree with that, but let's just talk from common sense. A man, when he gets angry, he could harm a woman far greater than if a woman can harm him, uh, gets angry, how she can harm her husband. So he says here, it's akad, even more important that the man think about sabr, patience, even more so uh, than his wife. Okay. Uh, he says here, the Prophet ﷺ has given more responsibility on the man, saying that he is the shepherd for the flock. All right? He is the shepherd for the flock. It is a sin enough for a man to neglect those in his care. It is a duty in Sharia that a man, okay, uh, um, uh, that a man uh, take care of his spouse. But it is, and his family. But it is not a duty for a woman to take care of her husband or her children. All right? So in the process of taking care of this uh, spouse, all right, the, uh, there's a lot of anger is going to happen, lack of patience, all right, frustration, and all these things that the man must swallow right, in order to actually uh, do his job properly. Okay? Guard yourselves and your families against the fire. This is, Allah has told men, guard yourselves and your families towards, against the fire. So he has to take care of them in this world. He has to take care of them regarding the next world, and making sure, at least outwardly, they're not doing what's wrong and they're doing uh, uh, what's a duty. And the woman has no such responsibility. Okay. Now, obviously, common sense will say that they would care, right? But as a... From the viewpoint of the Day of Judgment, Allah Azza wa Jal will not ask a woman why her children went astray. And He will not ask the woman why your husband went astray or earned unlawful income. But He will ask the man those questions. Okay, And that's a big deal. And that's why we have to be mature. And the young youth out there, they got to be mature. You should be studying, working, and being adults and get off the video games which is now extending into like the 20s and 30s and they're, they're doing this idiocy. So you got to grow up and be a man. And just to earn a halal income, forget the idea of the religion of your, of your family and the, all the responsibilities of being aware of what's going on in society. Okay? Being aware of what's going on in society. Forget about that. All right? Just earning a halal income. Add to that. Now we got to be aware of what's the impact of cell phones, what's going on with youth culture. You got to be aware of all this. It's almost another full-time job. Okay. And I don't talk about, you know, teens, but I see my friends telling me about uh, the teenage years and it's a whole nother ball game, another world. He continues, the more souls there are, the more this incitement is likely to increase. Okay. That is why someone gave this excuse for not marrying. My own soul is a trial. No, what, what he means here is that the more souls that you're responsible for, right, the greater the trial. You're responsible that your kids know how to pray. They know how aqidah. They're going out properly dressed. They're having good friends. You are responsible for this. Okay, You're not responsible for their intention, but you are responsible for giving it uh, your best shot. Okay, The more souls in your household, the more duty you have okay another man said i have difficulty taking care of my own dean that's why i'm not taking on a wife or children all right so again if it's contingent a person doesn't marry for a contingent person purpose that's permissible and i said i'm not even discussing this i don't think that there's any significant number of youth out there uh or people out there who want to go down the path of celibacy but uh at, in his time it was a discussion that amongst the worshipers it was a discussion that what's better to marry or not and there were many uh, worshipers who didn't marry uh, for those reasons but Ghazali always goes back and says it's far superior to marry than otherwise lastly okay lastly worldly distractions all right it is said uh, the worship that you're upon when you're single as soon as you get a job, cut it in half. As soon as you marry, cut that in half. As soon as you have children, cut that in half. 
And that's what you're going to be left with. So if you are a single bachelor young guy, take advantage of your time, and or woman, take advantage of your time in trying to draw near to Allah Azza wa Jalla and purify your heart now, because as soon as you get a job, cut it in half. As soon as you and as soon as you marry, you're going to be even more busy. And when you get kids, the game is over, right? Really, the game is over, and you're just going to be drowning to stay alive. Right, praying Aisha half asleep, going to pray Fajr, and the whole apartment smells like urine. Right, because of uh, the uh, you know bassinets and baby carriages and whatever. Right, and you know it, it becomes it, when you're in the cave of having few infants, and I have a friends, some friends who are in that, and I remember being in it myself. It's just the all I can remember is just how much the scent of urine is in your nose all the time and you become an expert in urine you know this is 72 hour old urine all right why wasn't this diaper taken out this is fresh urine right this sheet was just re recently wet uh you know uh and this you you become this very uh expert in bizarre things and you totally the mood of sitting down and doing hifz of quran or studying or doing dhikr is it, just no mood for that it's noise, it's diapers, it's uh, rattles. And then when things are good, when the kid is clean and it's squeaky clean and the house is clean, which lasts like an hour, uh, then the kid is so cute, you have to play with them, right? You have to play with them. And when you're done with that, and when you're done taking care of the kid, and you came home from work, now you're so exhausted, all you want to do is sit on the couch. So if you're in that phase, if you're one of those young uh, men or women who just had babies and you're having one or two or three little kids, by three you're already probably an expert, but one and two, you have to know it is understandable in the sight of Allah Azza wa Jal that your worship and ibadah and seeking knowledge will go down, right? Really low. But you have to know how much reward is in taking care of your child's and then your other spouse who's exhausted from taking care of the child, right? And your reward really becomes in that, more so than in actual individualized worship. So you have to understand that Allah knows best and He opens avenues. And earlier in this book, Imam al-Ghazali notes some narrations that said that the two rak'ahs from a man who's married and has dependents is superior in the sight of Allah than the whole night of worship for a single person, right? It's not even a comparison. Right, so this is the uh, heavy burden of this stuff, and it's very important for us because if we're if Muslims are going to survive the modern onslaught, we have to embrace this idea of marriage and children and deal with it and 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 come to enjoy it and come to love it and come to realize how much blessing is in it. At the same time, there's going to come a time when these kids start becoming more independent, and you get your time back, right? And that's when you can recoup. And, and get back to to some knowledge. But I'm telling you, if you never did it when you were single, it's gonna be extremely difficult for you to do it when you're having a job, married, and having kids. So if you're single, take advantage of it now, right? To, and learn the disadvantages of marriage, which we just mentioned, so that you could take advantage of your single life while you're still single, all right? So that's the uh, section here. That brings us to an end of this section. Uh, we can take any questions. Right? If anyone has any comments or questions, uh, we could open it up for that now. All right, so we got a question from Rimla here. It says, so we can't leave them an inheritance. The answer for inheritance is that a... Muslim and does not inherit from the non-believer. That's the answer to your question. And vice versa doesn't happen. You don't give them inheritance nor take inheritance. But a person can leave one-third of their wealth to non-inheritors. Right? So, because that's a good question. Let's say I'm a Muslim, I, uh, I convert to Islam and I have four sons. Three of them convert to Islam and one doesn't. Right? So three of them will inherit. The, the fourth one will not be an inheritor, but Allah knows best. Uh, you can ask a faqih uh, uh, 
but one third of your wealth can go to non-inheritors. So can one third go to that to your non-believing son? Right? Um, from what I know, the answer is yes, but ask a couple other fuqaha uh, about that. And a faqih, Ibn Rushd says that much, there are two types of scholars. There's the mujtahid, who derives the rulings directly from himself. And there's the faqih, who studies the ijtihads of other scholars. All right. Karim Ibn Skander says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, he will enrich married couples. Very good point. No one should not marry out of fear of impoverishment. Prophet Sallallahu said, marry and Allah will, uh, and Allah says in the Quran, so fi yughnikumullah min fadli. Allah will enrich you from what he has. Uh, Fawzia says, is it true that a husband is not required to pay for Islamic courses for his wife? The husband is required to educate his wife in Islam. That's an obligation. Okay? It's an obligation. I've been told that he is only required to pay her her food, shelter, and clothing. Nonsense. He has to educate her. In, or he has to facilitate her learning of Sharia. Uh, first of all, uh, Imam Madik is very sensitive about this. In Madiki Fiqh, and you can ask Sheikh Rami Ansur, if a man, if a woman talks to her husband, uh, if, if a woman talks to her husband, and he turns his back and ignores her without cause, that this itself is ground for, as considered a form of abuse and grounds for divorce. So the idea of making your woman miserable, right, itself is a problem. So, so someone who's going and giving me a list that you owe her two cups of rice, that you owe her a cup of water a day, don't be ridiculous. What books are you studying? Okay, because uh, in, in Maliki Fiqh, right, uh, it's considered abuse if she's made to be sad. Even for children, it's considered abuse to force feed them. To, con to, to force them to eat something that they don't want to eat is considered abuse. All right? So uh, the idea of abuse in the household is extremely a low threshold. It's not a high threshold. It's a low threshold. So even just the idea of having a reasonable request and then being unhappy, making the spouse unhappy in the house, that's part of uh, what we have to do here, all right? Is make sure the people in the house, as the Quran says, this household is made for Sakina for you, right? The marriage is made for Sakina. So if you're upset, then you're not having Sakina. And if the request is reasonable, it should be seen to. Would that mean her religious knowledge is primarily obtained from her partner? Yes, primarily her partner should be her teacher. If he has knowledge, well, why are you going to go study with some other guy when I'm right here, right? So that's the one thing. But if there is a reason for her to go and you don't have the knowledge, then she can study with someone else, all right? And what should she do if he has limited knowledge? Yeah, study with someone else. And why don't you go to Rabata and you got someone like Tamara Gray, she's a sister. She's a, a woman who's a scholar, so you're not going to be worried, oh, she's getting very close to the sheikh. Yeah, I would, I would have a problem with that. Like getting too close, you know, at least find a sheikh who's an old man. Uh, Ibrahim Khan says, Dear Sheikh, wh when do we know that we are ready for marriage when you, you can't stand being single anymore, right? When you have income and you're capable of taking care of another, uh, another uh, you know, person, you know? Also, how can I become a polite person as I think my habit of taunting might affect my marriage in the future? I mean, you're asking a wrong person. I'm not really a polite person myself. But uh, the only answer is marry, okay? And when you keep having bad experiences and she keeps being miserable, you'll learn your lesson. Ibrahim Khan says, can you also tell us how can we purify our hearts whilst we are unmarried First of all, on the purification of the heart, this is something I don't really want to talk about because it's a massive subject, which I would feel like a munafiq speaking about it. But the purification of the heart really occurs, and Ghazali, Imam Ghazali talks about this, with interaction with others. When you interact with other people, you realize how much junk you have in here. How much junk you have in here. Okay, And the actual act of purifying your heart has to do with emptying your stomach 
and doing much dhikr of Allah Azza wa Jal. That's really the summary of it. And I think the best dhikr is memorize the Quran because once you've memorized, you can recite it anywhere at all times. Right? There's the, just the idea that you can recite three or four juz on your own, on the drive, in the car, in bed before you sleep. Because the Prophet used to recite Quran laying down, so he, it's permissible. Right? It's very purificatory for the heart. I don't know if purificatory is a word, but now it is. Okay. Fatima bint Abdul Rauf says, Subhanallah, may Allah grant our men understanding. Does a woman have to all, always ask permission from her husband in order to go out? The husband, as he is responsible for her safety and her deen, does have the right to ask her not to go out. That is his right. If she's going somewhere that there is a potential harm that he sees. He does have that right. Okay. And of course, it should be bin ma'roof. Bin ma'roof is the, is the phrase which means in a good way. Because at the same time, the husband and the wife have the right to be happy in their life. You got to remember, this is an at-will agreement. An at-will agreement, I am at will giving you these rights and being answerable to you in these responsibilities. And uh, you are at will also giving me these rights and being answerable to me on these so there are rights and responsibilities, but both parties are coming at will. If you're in business, you know what an at will agreement is. It means at any time, either one could leave. Okay? If the woman wants to leave, if she's unhappy, that's enough of a reason. She gives back the dowry. If he abused her or he stopped praying or he gets on drugs, she doesn't have to give the dowry and she could just get out of the marriage just like that. Okay? Uh, Asya Quraysh says, How do we talk to a husband who does very long prayers all day reading surahs? How can I gently talk to him? You can ask his sheikh or his influential person to talk to him, that he would listen to, to talk, talk to him, and to be, uh, and to be, uh, uh, give him advice. Karim says, "Assalamu alaikum." What if the wife has a bigger income than the husband? Does he still have to provide her? The answer is yes. She could have a bigger income, but you got to pay for everything. Okay, you shouldn't ever say, "Look." You know, I'm eating, and who, who paid for it? Your wife paid for it? Let her have money. She can have money all she wants. you got to pay for everything. Part of the marriage deal is to live on the means of the husband. Right? And that's part of the deal. It's a contract. You're gonna, he's going to pay for everything, but you're going to live on his means. So if, if his income is here, and you're used to an income that's here, right? And you want to marry this guy, right? you got to accept that your livelihood is going to be now here. Okay, your, your way of life is going to be now here. Right. Orlando, long time no see, my brother. The story of Khalifa Omar anhu, and the brother seeking advice, his wife abusing him, but saw Omar's wife abusing him. Okay, so he wants us to talk about that hadith. Uh, Omar ibn Khattab was at home. A man came to knock on his door to complain about his wife. He heard Sayyidina Omar's wife raising her voice on Omar. So he turned back. Omar opened the door and said, what is it? He said, no, no, it's nothing. He said, tell me, what is it? He said, I came to complain about my wife, but I heard your wife is louder than mine. And Omar ibn Khattab says, she feeds us food. She cleans the house. She prepares our clothes. Shouldn't I have patience? Another man came to Omar and they were chit-chatting and he said, I want to divorce my wife. Omar said, why? He said, there's no more love. He said, where's loyalty and responsibility? Right? Is everything built on love? It's not. It's not all built on love. Where's loyalty and responsibility? So didn't you have like years before? What happened to that? You throw it out and there's responsibility. Right? So where's she going to go? You, have a, uh, you married a woman, you have five kids from her and then you divorce her. What do you want to do her, for, uh, her to do with herself? Right? So... Uh, what the Bible says, I'm interested what the rest of the sections are about. The rest of the sections, you're going to have to get them from Safina online, inshallah. The, we're slowly launching, and the launch this week is the Lives of Man series. Right? And eventually, right, the Lives of Man series this week. Zainab Nasir says, Can the husband restrict the wife from meeting her family? He, again, he can restrict her from leaving the house if he sees that there's a reason. Like, for example, it's in a dangerous part of town and he doesn't want her going there. Or it's a flight away and he doesn't want to fly. But he cannot restrict the father and mother from visiting him. Right? He can't close the door 
on the father and mother of his wife. He must let them in uh, at all times. Orlando says, sisters and brothers having hang-ups about age, although some the husband can provide everything physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Uh, yeah, I mean, age is flexible. Asiya says, does the husband have to tell the wife where he's going? The answer is no. It, technically, he does not. But yes, from the aspect of, again, remember what the Quran says. Marriage is about sakina. Both parties should be happy and at peace. So if you break that, right, then it's, you're not going to get a good result. <clears throat> what is the def? Uh, Rami Salah says, are there any books on the fiqh of marriage that you can recommend? Yeah, there's a lot of books. Any fiqh book has a section on marriage, and there are marriage. This book by Imam al-Ghazali is a good book to have. Um, uh, and there are a lot of other books. Back when I was younger, Ruqayya Waris Maqsood's book was out there. I can't remember. I don't know if it's still in print, but Ruqayya Waris Maqsood has that book. Uh, Ibrahim Khan says, What is the definition of a complete man and husband in Islam? I don't specifically, you know, have come across that phrase, a complete man or insan al-kamil, right? The, the, the more sunnas that a person piles on and the more discouraged acts that they stop doing, the more complete that they become. Uh, what the Basla says, so back to the hadith Orlando mentioned, is it the same for a woman if she wants to leave a marriage because there is no more love? Yes, it goes both ways, right? It does go both ways, that it goes for a woman too. That uh, what about responsibility? What about uh, uh, the uh, loyalty? Shumil, but it's not the same because a woman is, a man is not the dependent of his wife, right? So... Shumil Ali earlier says, surely women have, women have the same responsibilities. Um, if you want to know, the, the both sides have the responsibility to make sure the household is a place of peace and happiness. If you want to talk about physical responsibilities, the only physical responsibility that a woman has towards her man is she makes her phys herself physically, right, her body and her companionship available to her husband. When you want to talk about the material, that's the only uh, responsibility on her, right? The material responsibility is to make her, her physically and her companionship and her body available to her husband. In other words, to keep, that he can keep her company, okay? And, right, uh, have physical relations. On the man though, no. He's got a lot more responsibilities in this, that pertain to this life and the next life, okay? Adnan says, Salam, can you give prophetic advice on how to increase Sakina in our house? Yes, you could take the advice of Imam Ahmed or one of the other Imams said, whenever my wife gets angry, I just appease her. And whenever I get angry, she just appeases me. And if there, it takes two people to argue. If one gets angry, the other just stops. You can't be two angry people at the same house at the same time. So whenever there's a push from one side, the other gives back, right? pulls back. Okay, and if you want to be smart and you're saying, well, wait a second, there's right and wrong here. Right and wrong will never be rectified through an argument, right? This is just from experience, okay? It will never be rectified through an argument. Uh, secondly, most spouses, they argue over theoretical stuff, political positions, you know, who's guilty of what, that has nothing to do with day-to-day. -day. I'm telling, from... The experience of everyone who I've ever heard, you just leave those things. Don't even argue. Okay, so they think he's guilt. She thinks he's guilty, and I think he's innocent, right? Uh, I think he's oppressed, and she thinks he's a male chauvinist. Okay, fine. Whatever. Leave it. Um, she thinks football is dumb, and I think it's cool. Okay, fine. Good. No problem. No problem at all. She thinks romantic comedies are worth time, and I don't. Okay, fine. If it's going to take two hours to make your wife happy, then let her be happy. It's a problem. So you have to have that attitude 
of just let it go, right? As long as it's not in the deen, let it go. Not an issue. And that's the advice that Imam Ahmed gave. I'm not going to say here I'm the expert, but that's I'm acting upon that. I'm trying to act upon that. And we should all be trying to act upon that. I actually hate marriage advice and child-rearing advice because unless you're 70 and you've been married for 50 years and all your kids are already married, who are you to give advice? You haven't even lived, right? All right. Junaid Hayat says, how important is compatibility and how do we find out about it without meeting the person? You got to meet the person, right? You got, this is not a mail order spouse here. You got to at least meet the person, right? A couple times, but you will never know of 100% of compatibility. And here's the, here's the thing. The people who are believers in the dating scene, they will tell us, how can you Muslims meet the person three or four times and then marry the person, right? Well, we say meet three or four times, have an engagement of a couple months so more comes out of the person and then you can, you'll know, it's enough. Well, they say, no, we need to date for years and live with each other. Well, this is my argument back. You can know a person a thousand percent, right? Guess what? In life, people are going to change in the future anyway. You could know someone a thousand percent and you and they stay the same for 10 years, then all of a sudden they go unemployed and they become some extremist. Or the opposite, they just get some new friends, right? And they change their tastes in everything and they become a different person because some new neighbor moved in and he befriended him and he changed. There was a guy, and this is actually a documentary. There was a guy in the middle of life he got laid off, so he got another job. He got another job that required him to drive 90 minutes to work and 90 minutes back. The, the guy became a hardcore, he, he was from a regu regular guy, he became a hardcore right wing, almost like extremist. Why? Guess why? Talk radio on the commute. Because it's known, at least in the East Coast, I don't know about the other places, that the right wing control the radio and the left wing controls the TV except for Fox. So he kept listening to guys like Rush Limbaugh and these other guys, 90 minutes going, 90 minutes coming. It transformed him in the middle of his life to the point that he ended up getting a divorce from his wife and his kids hate him. So you can know someone a thousand percent, they're gonna change, right? Guaranteed people will change. So the idea of knowing someone a thousand percent before marrying them, it's a false idea. You're only going to know a person to a, to a degree if you know the fundamentals about the person. Uh, no, nothing funny has come up in the engagement. You took references. You asked around. That's the best you could do. Uh, compatibility, in my opinion, the more things you have in common, the easier the marriage. That means your parents are similar, similar backgrounds, similar uh, tastes and things, similar even ethnicity, right? This, if it's similar, it's easier. It doesn't mean you... It, it has to be, but it, it's a fact of life. It's easier. If 90% of the things in life are the same, right? Then there's going to be less causes of friction and easier life. That doesn't mean that we're advocating against inter-ethnic marriages, but I'm just saying it's easier. All right, Nahyan Asif says, can you please explain the wisdom behind only allowing a man to divorce his husband and not being allowed the other way around? Now, we said that that's not the case. A woman is allowed to seek a khula from her husband, even if she's just unhappy, but she must give back the dowry. She entered the marriage with a dowry. She exits the marriage with a dowry. The Prophet ﷺ received uh, the complaint of a woman, and she's mentioned in the Qur'an, in which she simply said, I have no complaints about the man, but I fear kufr, meaning I'm so miserable in life that my iman will go down because of this, and I will hate the man, okay? The Prophet ﷺ said, did he give you anything in the marriage? She said, yes, he gave me a little garden. He said, give it back, and then he called the man and he said, now divorce her. So uh, uh, this is actually one of the uh, sort of misunderstandings regarding marriage. Next question says, who is responsible for the wife's higher educational costs if she chooses to pursue it? Education, it's the responsibility of a husband to educate the wife as would be uh, the level of her peers, okay? If she wants to go above and beyond, 
then that's just something that she sh that, that he's not responsible for and they should if she is if she she wants him to be they should have discussed that before so if all of her peers are college educated to a certain level and he marries her the expectation is he will then complete to take her up to be equal to her peers so if all of her peers are doctors and PhDs and it's before getting married it's told to him you're expected to continue her education and pay for that then he has to right but if it just comes in her mind I actually I want to do a second PhD then it's not his responsibility however again I go back to the same commonsensical point that the concept is about marriages for Sakina both sides should apply common sense and make each other happy this is the only way to live there's not that's not a specific rule it's a general rule okay uh, because otherwise you're just not going to be happy right all right so I think that's uh, I think that's a wrap we'll stop here that is the fourth uh, part of uh, this series. The rest of them, you'll have access to them later on uh, through Safina Online. So, Jazakum Allah Khairan, and hopefully, we'll see you soon again. Assalamu alaikum.